Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, another program uh, from the Center for Innovation Policy here at Duke University. Uh, we are happy to uh, work with our co-sponsor, uh, the Sanford Schools Program on Cyber Policy, uh, to uh, organize this very important event. Uh, the uh, title of today's uh, program is Supply Chain Disruption, the United States, China, Taiwan, and the future structure of the global semiconductor industry. We have two very uh, distinguished experts uh, who will uh, join our panel. Uh, the first is Peter Cleveland. He is a vice president at uh, TSMC Corporation and uh, clearly TSMC is one of the world's leading uh, manufacturers of semiconductor chips uh, and is uh, well known if you've been reading the news lately. And uh, our second player is Paul Triolo. Paul is a noted expert on uh, China and uh, China's technological uh, rise. Yeah, he has spent time both in the corporate sector as well as in government uh, and has had a distinguished career uh, analyzing trends and development in China's uh, high technology industry. So to get started, what we are going to do is we're going to give each of our speakers about 10 minutes uh, to make some opening comments. Uh, then I will proceed with about 15 or 20 minutes of some uh, questions to carry on the dialogue. And uh, then we will open up the discussion to our audience. Um, our program will run till about 1.45 p.m. Um, and we'll try to give the speakers a few minutes to make a, some closing remarks if we have uh, time. Uh, if you have questions and uh, would like to propose questions, uh, please use the uh, Q&A function uh, in the, uh, the Zoom uh, technology. And uh, with that, I will turn the floor over to Peter and uh, we'll get started today. Peter, the floor is yours. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, it's terrific to be here. Uh, it's an enormous honor to join you and Paul and others at Duke, really one of the preeminent higher education institutions in our country and in the world. Um, just in terms of some introductory remarks, Duke, Duke, uh, to keep it light, getting started, Duke figures very prominently in my life. Many, many years ago, I was um, uh, getting together with my then girlfriend for some weekend activities, and she told me that she was canceling all of that to go to a Duke LSU basketball game at Cameron Indoor Stadium. Allison went to LSU, and her father had gotten her tickets, and so that was uh, a good sign to me that I had a big basketball fan on my hands who I married, and she had a tremendous weekend down at Cameron and at Duke. Uh, LSU lost to Duke that weekend, but that's okay. Uh, and the only other note I'd like to make, I'd like to drop one foot down about Professor Hoffman at Duke, a longtime colleague and friend of mine in the semiconductor industry. He's an incredible resource at Duke, uh, someone who is just world class in his uh, areas of expertise of digital privacy and uh, data security and cyber. So Duke very, very fortunate to have him. So in terms of your introduction about TSMC, um, that's where I work. I'm a lobbyist at uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, arguably the most important company in the world that nobody has ever heard of. Um, we make chips, we make semiconductors, the digital engines inside of laptops, desktops, supercomputers, autonomous vehicles. Uh, we make leading bleeding edge chips. They are incredibly important and we're a very successful company. Uh, this year we'll come in uh, probably under, just under $80 billion in terms of our top and bottom line. Uh, we've been around for about almost four decades, three and a half decades. And TSMC is a pure play dedicated foundry, just to give you a basic explanation of what we do. All we do is focus on making uh, the semiconductor inside of so many different products that people use. And um, there are metrics that can be associated with the chips that we make. We make uh, 12,000 different products. We have 500 different customers. We have about 78, 80,000 patents, but what we're particularly known for 
is the speed, the performance, the functionality, the efficiency, the transistor density of the best chips. And the company has great corporate humility about that um, and has done very, very well over many, many years and is a crucial supplier into the US technology ecosystem. The NVIDIA's, the Qualcomm's of the world, the AWS's handset players, TSMC makes that chip, that leading, bleeding edge chip inside of all those products. So very, very important. Um, in terms of the topic today, uh, I'm going to rely on Paul, my counterpart, uh, on to talk about some geostrategic and over the horizon thinking vis-a-vis -vis China, Taiwan, and the United States. I'm a I'm a lobbyist. I don't want to get out over my skis on um, big thinking types of topics because I have a pretty linear, narrow focus uh, in terms of the company's business and our advocacy. At the same time. I'll give a, I might provide a, a short factual predicate about Taiwan and where we do a lot of our manufacturing. We're diversifying our footprint in many different places in the world, but we primarily manufacture um, in Taiwan. So Taiwan, as I think many people know, has had a separate, peaceful, independent, uh, autonomous status for 70 plus years since Chiang Kai-shek left the mainland. Um, and there's a lot of diplomatic architecture and um, uh, that exists to maintain good tie lines between the United States, China, and Taiwan over the years, which I think many people are familiar with. The Taiwan Relations Act, which Congress passed in 1979, something called the three communiques between the United States and China in the early 70s, 79 and 82, that uh, uh, between China and the United States is uh, uh, the guidelines for how we work together on Taiwan matters. And then there's something called the Six Assurances, which also is a, a, formulate, a formulation of US policy towards Taiwan uh, that ensures uh, that country's economic and civil um, status. All very, very important. That, that infrastructure, that uh, microarchitecture for the relationship are really the ties that bind that in these times should uh, be focused on uh, in terms of how we engage in dialogue over topics going forward, like semiconductors, for example, and semiconductor supply chain resiliency. Um, Paul might have some more comments about uh, the challenges that the Taiwan and China and the United States face uh, going forward, but at TSMC or company, we have publicly talked about a peaceful approach and dialogue going forward to ensure the crown jewel industry of semiconductor fabrication in Taiwan. And I just, I was watching Secretary uh, uh, Austin the other day, Defense Secretary Austin the other day, talk about open routine lines of communication with his counterparts in Beijing. And that's a good idea of uh, making sure that uh, all the parties keep talking in a peaceful way versus trying to um, elevate tension uh, unnecessarily. So what I've spent the most time on the last couple of years is something called the Chips and Science Act. Uh, from uh, beginning to end, it was introduced and then enacted into law in 26 months. Uh, it started in June of 2020 uh, as introduced by John Cornyn, uh, Senator from Texas, on Capitol Hill, a fantastic lawmaker who had some intuition about this topic and how important it is for the United States to make these chips here. When we talk about resiliency, the United States has fallen off the mark. And uh, a couple of years ago, Senator Cornyn and Mike McCall in the House and Doris Matsui and Senator Mark Warner uh, introduced companion legislation together to change that, to fix that problem. And Congress uh, brilliantly over a 26 month time frame, and bipartisanly was able to get the CHIPS Act across the line on August 9th to address the gaps in US production of particularly leading, leading edge chips, the most advanced chips. Uh, Secretary Raimondo has talked quite a bit about that, that the US is in crisis uh, because we don't manufacture that anymore in North Carolina and Texas and California, 
we have to be able to fabricate chips that are the fastest and best and most dynamic in the world. And the Chips and Science Act will now help the United States do that. Um, there are very few companies. In fact, I would probably uh, submit that it's really up to TSMC to help the United States uh, on the leading edge. And we're doing that with a huge investment in Phoenix. Uh, we've been constructing there for about a year and a half, uh, five nanometer fab. Uh, there's more news to come there as we expand that facility, but it's a good partnership with the US government uh, to get the United States back on its feet on the leading edge. And um, Congress was critical in doing that. In that bill, there's 39 billion for uh, fabrication and there's a particular focus on advanced wafer fabs, which are incredibly expensive to construct. Our facility in Phoenix is on track on time. It's been challenging, but we'll be spinning wafers uh, out of that fab in late uh, 23. And uh, it's an incredibly exciting moment to try to help the United States refortify and reestablish advanced uh, chip manufacturing here on US soil. Now, why is that? And I'll finish on this point and then turn it over to Paul. The United States can't allow these types of chips to be manufactured overseas given the critical role and nature that uh, some of these chips perform. For example, there was a recent announcement about the fastest supercomputer in the world at Oak Ridge National Lab, not too far from Duke, uh, uh, just, uh, just west in, in Tennessee. And that's what the United States needs to have a lead in supercomputers. And it runs on CPUs, about 35,000 of them, and GPUs, a different type of chip called the graphics processing unit that the uh, TSMC uh, makes. And so that's important. In terms of some of the United States' most important intelligence and military systems, for example, the F-35 aircraft, TSMC chips are in the cockpit suite to help uh, F-35 uh, fighter pilots uh, address uh, or see in avionics systems friend versus foe very, very quickly. So it's certain types of functions that uh, require us uh, to make those types of chips here on the US, on US soil, and we're headed in that direction. I think it's very positive and the news is good. It's going to take some time. And final, final point, I would say that besides David Hoffman, a prodigal son of Duke, uh, there's another Duke uh, figure, uh, uh, an individual named Ronnie Chatterjee, who's at the White House and he's on leave uh, from Duke. He's an economist at the business school, I think. Um, he's now in a position, actually recently announced, to run this program of implementation for um, the Chips and Science Act. And so he's got an incredibly nimble mind. I uh, uh, know Ronnie and he's got a full plate. This will not be easy. This is a very hard industry to understand. He's got a lot of money that he's got to uh, help figure out with President Biden and Secretary Raimondo how to provide that incentive support to uh, companies. And I'm optimistic. I think better days are ahead and supply chain resiliency is going to be a good news story for the United States in the chip space. So with that, let me, uh, uh, that's just a brief introduction. Let me turn it over to, to Paul and I look forward to hearing from him. Thanks, Peter. Uh, what a great um, introduction. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize Peter's uh, <laughs> points about um, the need for peaceful discussions around Taiwan um, and China, between Taiwan, China, and the US, I think that's a really, really critical issue, which I think uh, we will get to uh, in more depth here. Um, also very excited about the CHIPS Act. Um, we have a number of clients uh, in that space that will be helping uh, through that process of figuring out how to navigate the CHIPS Act. So it's a very exciting time in some sense to be in the semiconductor industry. <laughs> so there's sort of, you know, good news, bad news. Um, uh, but it's a very it, clearly semiconductors are um, you know are, are front of mind now uh, for the U.S. government and and the Chinese government and other places in ways they weren't arguably a, a couple of years ago um, before the chip shortage and before um, some of the other issues we'll discuss. So what I'd like to do, uh, since I'm coming at this from sort of a geopolitical risk point of view, 
uh, trying to understand the risks around the industry and how those have changed over the past decade in particular, getting us up to speed to, to th this week, which is a, an important week, as we'll talk about, because the U.S. government uh, appears to be on the cusp of um, issuing some new export controls and other measures around semiconductors that, that we'll, we'll want to touch on uh, and re related to China that will also involve Taiwan and TSMC. Um, but I think it's important to just step back quickly and sort of you know understand how we've gotten here uh, with a, with a bit of a focus on on um, the semiconductor space. So I think you know the the one arguably the 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 place to start and there's many places to start would be the the ascension in China of Xi Jinping in, in 2012. Uh, he was his agenda include already very early on included um, a lot of help for the technology sector in general and uh, for the the semiconductor industry in particular. So uh, over the course of the first years of the of, of, of Xi Jinping's um, uh, rule, if you will, in Beijing, uh, China set up a national IC investment fund. IC here being integrated circuits, another way to talk about semiconductors. Um, she launched things like the Belt and Road, Made in China 2025, um, and the National AI Strategy. Uh, and, and then as we got into the into the later stages of the Obama administration and into the, the Trump administration, technology uh, became sort of one of the key issues, if not the most important issue in the bilateral relationship. In fact, in May of this year, uh, Secretary of State Blinken basically put technology competition, if you will, uh, at the in the center of U.S.-China relations. And so I think that that reflects, you know, sort of a period of, of, of over the last arguably five to seven years of sort of ramped up uh, competition around um, the, uh, the technology space. And again, there's a couple of themes there that we need to, we need to talk about. Um, one is that the growing perception in the US that China's military, for example, was leveraging US technology and, and leveraging access to US companies and technology in, in various technology spaces to improve China's military modernization. The so-called military civilian fusion uh, initiative in China, which again, Xi, Xi Jinping sort of has thrown his full weight behind. Um, so that's one thing out there that's driving some of the U.S. actions uh, in this space, for example. And then there's also this, this perception that uh, that China it, it potentially could use some of these technologies, whether it's semiconductors helping to train AI algorithms for things like facial recognition, that China was uh, would, would, would misuse some of these technologies in ways that uh, democratic countries and uh, and systems would 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 find um, objectionable. So, for example, the use of AI uh, and facial recognition for um, uh, you know uh, surveilling dissidents and and other other measures, um, and, and and that's big, that's also a big theme here. Of course, those AI is again underlain by all these semiconductors that we've talked about that Peter so ably laid out uh, initially. So, I think that that the, the but the establishment of that national IC fund is critical to understand because that did a couple of things. It galvanized U.S. focus on semiconductors in general. Arguably, and for Chinese companies um, uh, that that um, that were it, it sort of cast a spotlight on Chinese firms that were reliant on U.S. to some degree on U.S. semiconductor technology, um, and this sort of generated new interest in the U.S. government and around uh, particularly things like CIF, the CFIUS process, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the U.S. to scrutinize. Uh, Chinese acquisition of, of semiconductor companies with the U.S. with U.S. IP or, or located in the U.S. Uh, it, 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 it also, I think, arguably distorted China's the development of China's semiconductor industry by by focusing heavily on manufacturing um, at, at versus things like semiconductor manufacturing equipment, which I think is a really important distinction, which we'll talk about, and other key parts of the supply chain. So the the National IC Fund was very focused on manufacturing, kind of like the Chips Act in the U.S. Um, and it also ended up, of course, though, being a mixed bag. And, and just recently, of course, we've seen um, a major corruption uh, probe into the National IC Fund um, that has basically taken down the entire leadership of the fund. Um, and that's, I think, a reflection also that the fund did not produce the results that China and Xi Jinping are arguably wanted in terms of self-reliance, which we can also talk about. So, um, I think that's 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 a, a big a big piece of it. But of course, uh, at the same time, uh, Xi and the Chinese leadership continues to focus on this idea of self-reliance um, and recreating essentially some big pieces of the semiconductor supply chain in China, which which is a really really tall order, um, as, as we can talk about. So, I think what happened then in response, the U.S. government. Uh, to some of this action that I've mentioned on the Chinese side, 
um, really, really began to focus more and more and more on the whole semiconductor space. So in 2016, for example, we had Penny Prisker, the Commerce Secretary, allege that basically the Chinese fund was designed to appropriate the global semiconductor supply chain. Um, and again, the issue there was subsidies, heavy subsidies, um, and, and a big, a big uh, focus on how the Chinese government was using subsidies and how those might distort this very market-driven sector. And, and then at the same time as we got into the Trump era, we started seeing the weaponization on the U.S. side of, of the dominance of, uh, of, the, of these key semiconductor supply chains um, with, with companies like Huawei being put on the Commerce Department entity list. Uh, a lot of AI companies in China, of course, also added to the entity list. And then critically, I think, uh, which brings us back to TSMC and, and Peter, um, this extension uh, through the, what the so-called foreign direct product rule in 2020 of U.S. export controls extraterritorially to include any company around the world that was manufacturing semiconductors on behalf of, in this case, Huawei. Um, and so that immediately sort of dragged Taiwan into the into the into the mix here. And so, it will, as we as we'll see, that's 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 a process that is continuing to play out. And also, we could see uh, other companies added to that um, uh, to that uh, entity list and and foreign direct product rule uh, sort of um, measure and initiative. Um, at the same time, too, we've seen um, the U.S. government become increasingly concerned about China's domestic manufacturing capabilities. So as Peter noted, TSMC is, is really the global leader in, in, at the most advanced nodes, along with Samsung. Uh, and of course, Intel in the U.S. Is, is, is not far behind. Those three really lead the world in advanced manufacturing. Um, but the but, but Chinese company uh, known as SMIC, the Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, is also a major player in that foundry space. That, uh, that Peter mentioned. And so SMIC has been moving up the, the sort of technology chain, but because of um, a decision uh, within the US government and also in the multi multinational uh, export control related group, the Wassenauer Group, basically uh, SMIC has been cut off from the most advanced, uh, some of the most advanced technology like uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography, um, which is needed to make some of those, uh, to, to manufacture some manufacturers at some of those more advanced nodes. So the US government, again, sort of began, began to, 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 to adopt a policy that has essentially been to slow China's uh, domestic manufacturing capability um, with the, these controls on SMIC. Um, and then the most recent sort of manifestation of all this concern around semiconductors um, is the controls, which will be, we'll probably see clarified this week, um, around very specific types of semiconductors, in this case, those GPUs that Peter mentioned earlier, the graphics processing units, which, as he noted, are used for things like high-performance computing. They're used uh, to, to train AI workloads. Um, and, there's, and China is heavily dependent on certain of those, those semiconductors from companies like NVIDIA and AMD. And so in August, for example, we had uh, the Commerce Department send out letters to those companies warning that basically um, they were, they were going to face uh, uh, licensing requirements or or even a complete ban of exports of those semiconductors to China. And that's a pretty big deal. Um, and then, of course, the other the other sort of piece of the puzzle, as Peter noted, is is that the, the U.S. government um, on the sort of there's sort of the control side, the restriction side, and then there's the industrial policy side. The U.S. government through the Chips and Sci Act um, is really now focused on sort of support uh, to the industry. And that's the mirrored in other places like Europe with the and South Korean governments are also uh, heavily support their own domestic industries. And so we've had we, we've had this sort of renewed um, emphasis on industrial policy in the semiconductor sector, which of course is also to some degree driven by China, um, although arguably in the case of the CHIPS Act, you know, most of that onshoring of those those facilities that, that Peter mentioned, uh, for example, in Arizona by TSMC is really driven by concern that China could take action against Taiwan that would essentially cut off um, uh, some of that, some of those facilities in Taiwan from, from functioning. Um, and then that if the US did not have uh, that capability domestically, that would be that would be bad. Um, and so 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 the, the US, the CHIPS Act is driven both by the need to, to, to jumpstart the US domestic manufacturing, but also by this greater, greater geopolitical concern um, about China and its intentions vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Um, so in any case, I think I'll stop there. There's lots we can dive down deeper into um, as Dennis uh, leads us through this, but I think the bottom line is, yes, yeah, semiconductors are, are front and center in the US-China relationship. Taiwan is a big part of that discussion. 
Um, and we need some, I, what I would argue is some creative thinking going forward here to do what Peter noted earlier, which is to sort of preserve those crown jewels um, of the industry and avoid conflict over Taiwan, for example, um, amidst you know growing tensions in US-China relations and other complications that we saw, for example, after the Pelosi visit um, in August, which uh, which increased considerably tensions across the Strait. So semiconductors front and center, US-China, Taiwan relations, um, really complicated, uh, but critical to understand uh, for the industry going forward. Great, great. Thank you both. Uh, do you both ever get any sleep with all of this going on? It's, uh, it's a busy time to be in this business. Um, okay, let me first remind the audience, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A function to raise questions, and I promise you we'll try to work those into the discussion. Um, let me start off with sort of a, a historical perspective, and this is a, maybe for Peter, and I have a counterpart question uh, for Paul. So in 1978, I happened to write a doctoral dissertation about Taiwan's uh, development of its semiconductor industry. Uh, it was just beginning. The Shinju High Tech uh, Park was just being established. Um, uh, KT Lee, the uh, father of high tech in Taiwan, was my uh, uh, informal advisor for this. And I was there at the creation. And uh, to be very honest, it was rough going for Taiwan at the beginning. In fact, it didn't look likely that Taiwan was going to make it. it. It had some choices to make in semiconductor and it, it, it initially made some bad choices between RCA and use electronics and a bunch of other stuff like this. But somehow it's all worked out. And uh, we're at a stage where TSMC, as, you, as Peter has identified, is not only just a major player, uh, but as Tom Friedman said today at a Brookings seminar, it is also a trusted player. And uh, that's what gives it the credibility to have reached this level. How do you explain the success overall of Taiwan at the end of the day and, and, and TSMC in particular in getting to this point? Because um, you know a lot of things were standing in its way and somehow it's ended up in this very central position and now centrally global you know, position. Um, it, it's, it is a little bit of a miracle in some ways. Yeah, fair, fair, fair point, Dennis, and thoughtful remarks from Paul, too, um, which uh, his were more wide ranging, and uh, I'll be interested to confer with him further on some of his points. But you, I, you I'll have to read your doctoral dissertation. <laughs> well, uh, that sounds interesting. They, in 1986-87, what, what happened was that Morris Chang and Itri, um, they invented a new segment in the semiconductor ecosystem. And you're correct. I think it was bumpy early, uh, but the pure play dedicated foundry model has turned out to be brilliant. And we're not the only ones that do it. There's UMC, there's Global Foundries, there are others, but there's no question TSMC was the first mover. And that was due to Morris Chang focusing on the heavy duty, difficult part of uh, the chip business, which is the actual making of that chip. And uh, what it allowed was for designers to flourish over the decades, the NVIDIAs, the Qualcomm's, the Apple's, they design and we make. And so it, uh, a, a divide and conquer approach allowed them to specialize and allowed us to specialize as well on process node development and actually take the heavier burden of the cost. Frankly, when you have brilliant designers like AWS and Cerebras and many, many others, they through their software product can be incredibly ingenious and creative. And then they send the GDS2 file, the software file to us. And it's a combination of strengths. It's taken a long time to, um, get the synchronicity right and to uh, gel our work with theirs, but it's turned out to be a business model issue. That has been critically important. Now, Chips and Science Act helps because now at the two and 1.4 nanometer area, as we get really advanced, it's super, super expensive for us to keep moving ahead on the transistor density, on interconnect feature sets, on new advances in the R&D space to keep the engine humming on technology progress. But I would say the corporate business model and the creation of it by Morris Chang 
uh, was sheer, sheer brilliance. I put him in a different category of an Andy Grove uh, uh, and others that, uh, who made a seminal contribution uh, to the industry. Great. Yeah, and I, I would just quickly jump in and foot stomp that. I think Peter almost understates that, that sort of genius and the sense of, of building that trust between both the client side, uh, the great designers at NVIDIA and Apple and others, and the, and the tool makers, right? So TSMC sits in this very unique juncture between those two very capable and innovative worlds and has really fueled innovation in, in both those areas by making sure that the tool makers are plugged in and their latest designs can, 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 can work with, the, with the, 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 the designs coming from the clients and, and really pushing the envelope in a way that no other you know, business model has been able to do. That's precisely what China lacks, for example, too, in terms of the ecosystem around, around the whole foundry model and really driving the sort of industry as a whole forward. Um, and I think, you know, it's really hard to understate the, the impact that, that TSMC and the business model have had on the entire industry in terms of driving forward innovation. Cerebras, I just mentioned quickly, is a great example where they wanted to use the whole wafer uh, as part of developing an AI uh, focused semiconductor, and they worked very closely with Peter as at TSMC, and to just, to figure out how to do that because that really was a, a novel approach to uh, to a problem. How do you use the whole wafer and and, and the interconnects and everything? Um, and that's a good example of how you know without the TSMC model there, it's hard to see how that would you know that that kind of uh, innovative semiconductor could have been built you know and 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 manufactured at commercial scale. So I think that's really a, 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 it's a really a tribute to to you know to not just Morris Chang but you know the Taiwan government. You could argue, arguably it treats some of the the, 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 the R and D units in Taiwan, and then just the support um, uh, there that 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 that, that the company's gotten in Taiwan, um, and then the, the industry has sort of you know come come to see this as really um, the, the a really um, you know important um, uh, development. I personally, of course, I'm, I'm happy to have my Tesla. I believe the, the 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 hardware chip in my Tesla, which does all the video processing, very complicated task, is made by TSMC in Taiwan. I know Tesla has been using different manufacturers, but you know that's the kind of sort of application specific integrated circuit that uh, and, and innovation that that TSMC has really made possible. Um, and so I I, I commend uh, Peter and the company for that for that innovation. So let me jump 10 years ahead now. And in 1988, I wrote a book on the Chinese electronics industry. And uh, in that book, I, it was China's equivalent of the effort to uh, uh, jumpstart its electronics industry, post-cultural revolution, et cetera. And uh, there was the Cao He Jing high-tech zone where this was all supposed to you know, crystallize, et cetera, except as you indicated, Paul, it really hasn't happened the way. And we've seen uh, the Chinese government pour billions of dollars into its semiconductor industry in different ways all along the last 20 years. This is uh, China's efforts to, to close the gap in semiconductor is not something that happened you know, uh, two years, three years, five years ago. It's been going on for 20 plus, plus years. So why Taiwan makes it, you know, we heard, but why doesn't China make it? I mean, why is the struggle <laughs> continue? And as right. you indicated, they just wiped out the leadership of the, of right. the IC fund and uh, they continue to kind of struggle at this. And, uh, you know, you could ask the question, is the United States overly worried because these guys keep stepping on their own two feet and uh, maybe there's not that much to worry about? Well, it's a great question. It's a complicated issue it's, it's to, to sort of tease out the, the the factors that have have led China and Chinese companies to be to, to be behind the curve. But of course, they were starting from a very low base, right? So at one level, wow, you know, YMTC, which has received funding, for example, from the National IC Fund, is now uh, producing memory, 3D NAND memory that Apple is is trialing for its iPads and iPhones. So there are these individual pieces of the semiconductor supply chain, if you will, where where China has made a tremendous amount of progress. The problem, uh, the underlying problem though is this is really a global industry, right? And the global su the, cha the supply chains are global. And so you have pieces of technology coming from Japan and from the Netherlands and from Taiwan and from the US. Um, and so it's it, it's not an industry where one country 
uh, or group of companies in one country can really, you know, sort of reproduce all aspects of the supply chain. So China has struggled, in fact, um, a little bit as I noted earlier, to figure out, you know, where where it should it, its companies should should sort of play a role here uh, most effectively in the global industry. And then there are these three really critical factors where I think China has has has. Has, has 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 had some issues. The funding issue is one that Peter mentioned earlier, the CapEx expenditure. It's a very expensive industry to do the R&D and keep up with. That's not really a problem in China in some sense. You have the National IC Fund, you have a lot of uh, venture capital sloshing around in China. Money is not a, not so much an issue, the, but 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 the money issue is really, you know, what are viable projects to invest in, right? Because there's there's not a real understanding of that in China. And I think that's part, part of what happened with the IC Fund and the corruption is, you know, everybody is saying they're a semiconductor company and nobody was really like really evaluating the viability of those projects. The second issue that was personnel. And again, th this is where China behind the curve, right? Taiwan has been educating hardware engineers, you know, forever. And I think TSMT takes up something like 50 or 60% of all the STEM graduate students in Taiwan. Um, I saw a study that said by, you know, 2030, that would be like 85%, right? So Taiwan has this very high concentration and very good education system. China does too, but China um, ha has only recently gotten into the game of, of developing hardware hardware engineers. And really, to, to drive semiconductor manufacturing, you need a cadre of, of, of really well-trained engineers um, who have lots of experience in the industry, you know, working, designing, working with all these tools and, and really understand, you know, what, what it takes to drive um, innovation in the sector. And China just doesn't have yet a critical mass of that. And critically, though, even more important, I think, is that management level where the managers who really understand, you know, global markets and global customers and what customers need and really can help to drive um, the industry forward in the sense of, you know, creating commercially viable companies and gaining customer trust and really, you know, pushing that envelope forward. China has sort of lacked in that too. China has, of course, poached a lot of engineers and managers from places like TSMC and other companies in Taiwan um, to try to help with that problem. And, and that's, that's there's been sort of a mixed success there. And then finally, the technology and the innovation part of it. So the, the, secret of, uh, the secret sauce of TSMC and Intel and Samsung to some extent is the ability to invest in R&D and keep ahead of the game here and keep investing in the latest technology and processes and understanding where the industry is going and drawing on global R&D efforts uh, in places like IMEC in, in Belgium and, and other, other areas. That's what the one of the pieces of the chips act that 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 uh, that is critical for the US which is developing that R an R&D capability in the US the NSTC um, that's part of the Chips Act, um, and so I think you know that's where China has hasn't been able to put together sufficient pieces of the puzzle to develop individual companies, with some exceptions, of course, as I mentioned, like YMTC, that 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 can sort of play and fit into the global division of labor in ways that make them globally competitive. Um, Huawei and, and High Silicon were an example of a design company, for example, which were certainly very globally capable and were designing semiconductors, you know, on par with Qualcomm and some of the other companies. That, that Peter mentioned, um, but of course they've now fallen under U.S. Uh, export control. So recently, of course, the problem has been that the, the, the U.S. Uh, actions and, and restrictions in the space have complicated the, the, the picture in China, uh, forced more the, more emphasis on self-reliance, but the problem is still you can't you can't easily throw money at this problem um, and fix it and try to catch up. So I think really the issue is not so much will China catch up, but how will China adapt to the new reality here, which is that they're going to be restricted. They're going to have to find innovative ways to get by without the leading technologies uh, in these areas. And that's really the question. Um, not so much are they going to catch up or how do they catch up, but but how do they adapt? It seems that uh, a, a lot of these issues percolated up to the surface, particularly because of the disruptions brought about uh, from COVID. And COVID brought to the surface a lot of issues. And semiconductors obviously uh, were affected. We know that you know people who wanted to buy cars or uh, electric uh, ovens, you know, they they couldn't get them because even even basic chips weren't weren't available. But it does raise a question: Are there some larger forces at work here that are altering the fabric of the semiconductor industry. Uh, for example, Moore's law, are we seeing Moore's law evaporate all of a sudden? Or are we seeing a uh, technological opportunity out there that is changing the dynamics of the industry? Is this a, a function of COVID, uh, some political strategic issue, or is there something to do with the technology and the innovation models that are, that are now uh, moving into center stage? Peter, anything to say on sure. this one? 
Sure, let me echo uh, Paul's very smartly stated uh, comments. The microprocessor is the most difficult product in the world to make. It's not a rubber ducky toy. And I think the Chinese are now understanding how difficult this is. Uh, what Paul is saying is the ecosystem is there's an enormous amount of synergy that exists way upstream from us, from the EDA players, electronic design automation players that make the initial software. That's Cadence, that's Synopsys, that's Mentor, who sell it to fabulous players like uh, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, AMD, who then send a software file to us and we use the tools of an applied, a KLA or a LAM, and then we make it. You have to think of the tool makers, the fabulous players, the EDA players, and the enormous amount of synergy that ex exists that has uh, perfected these processes. And then at the back end, and this gets to your question about Moore's law, the back end now is becoming even more crucial. We make the chip, but the complexity of this as transistor density scaling uh, begins to recede, uh, a lot more interest is now moving to uh, packaging, uh, interconnect feature sets, backside power, heterogeneous architecture, how we contain the heat envelope in the packaging to uh, accelerate innovation. And so uh, the system, the ecosystem from EDA all the way to the back end is critically important. China has really struggled to get a handle on it. And as we move forward, the innovation may be, what you're pointing at, Dennis, may be in terms of how we stack chips, how we uh, uh, deal with thermal power management, uh, it, given the reality, the law of physics about transistor density, you can't keep shrinking them at a Moore's law rate. It's incredibly uh, important. The United States is in position A to sail ahead. Uh, and the US government final point is in a very powerful position as Paul was talking about vis-a-vis -vis export controls and policy tools to ensure that the United States leads. At TSMC, we're, we sell to everybody. We, we, we sell to China. We believe the Ch Chinese people are, um, that's a good market for us uh, commercially, but we follow the rules, the laws, the regulations, the edicts of the United States uh, uh, to the letter, uh, given the importance of the US in this whole equation. Yeah, and let me just, again, jump in and quickly add, a, 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 I agree with everything Peter said here. I think that the, the packaging part is really important, and that's going to be the focus of this new S NSTC in the U.S. Is it some advanced packaging technologies? Japan, for example, we talk to the Japanese all the time. Um, they have a they have a, a national semiconductor strategy, which is very well thought out. There, they realize they're not going to compete or try to do too much advanced manufacturing in Japan. They just don't really have the infrastructure or the or the the the, the engineers. But they're gonna they're gonna focus on that packaging, and they want to be a player. Their companies want to be want to be players in that advanced packaging. And so they're looking at that sort of sub two nanometer packaging part of the, of the equation. And they're, they, they have a very well thought out strategy. Um, they, so I think there'll be some synergy, of course, that between Japan and the US on that. Um, and, and TSMC and Taiwan, of course, will also be part of that as, as, the, as the sort of packaging ecosystem evolves. You get some standards around things like chiplets. Um, and, 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 and it looks like, unfortunately, probably China's gonna be left out of a lot of that sort of movement in, in, in the way of standardized packaging. So China is a big player in some of the legacy packaging. Um, um, as is Taiwan, but I think um, in the U.S., you know, onshoring manufacturing will will ne of necessity at some point uh, require onshoring some of those upstream and downstream uh, technologies that Peter mentioned, like the packaging, like some of the wafer production and process gases, because it doesn't make sense at some level to you know have advanced manufacturing in the U.S. and have and ship everything from Asia and then ship it back for packaging. So the U.S. Uh, getting back to Peter's comment about how difficult it will be, um, the U.S. is trying to on shore at the same time, a lot of different pieces uh, of that of that of those critical supply chains, both sort of upstream and downstream. Um, and then packaging will be the really critical one there that for, for the US to really make advances in. Both of you mentioned the, the Chips and Science Act. And uh, of course, uh, some people say, ah, this is US industrial policy. 
and the United States has, you know, shied away from industrial policy. Some people say we're starting to emulate the Chinese, you know, trying to have state-driven policies that are going to make the semiconductor industry competitive in the future. Is this a lost cause, or is there something really uh, to be gained from the the way the Chips Act has been presented? You, you, you may know that not uh, not everyone voted for the Chips Act. Uh, uh, there were some people who were opposed. It wasn't. Uh, uh, Chinese enough, you know, anti-Chinese enough. Uh, there were others that, uh, you know, suggested that it was this industrial policy. So I'm curious, do you think that, you know, that is this uh, uh, defines a distinct move in the way the United States needs to look at global competition as we look out, you know, in the years ahead? I can jump in quickly here and then and then I'm, I'm eager to hear Peter's views on this. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that all advanced uh, economies um, that have semiconductor industries pro have provided some support for this. So when the CHIPS Act was being discussed, um, it was really in the sense of, okay, the U.S. needs to sort of step up its game here because, um, you know, Germany, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, all, all these governments have provided some uh, incentives and, and, and ben benefits to, to encourage that semiconductor manufacturing industry. And so and at one level, the U.S. was, was just sort of trying to say, hey, we're, we're, we're going to level the playing field uh, and provide these incentives. Otherwise, of course, it would be really difficult for a company like TSMC to justify uh, putting a fab in the US with the with the with the increased costs um, across the board you know just hiring an engineer of course you know you're talking about probably double the cost of an engineer in the US versus uh, a, a country like Taiwan um so so the US is the part of the chips act game is to sort of get the US in the in, into the arena of being able to provide these incentives understand how to do this you know we've lost the muscle flexing of you know how to do industrial policy at scale or in in in, in let alone in a complicated industry um, like the semiconductor industry, so uh, it's really an important, you know, part of the part of the equation here. Of course, Morris Chang and and uh, and others, you know, in Taiwan are, are skeptical. Of course, uh, I think as Peter mentioned earlier, how difficult this was. They're skeptical about the long term commitment of the U.S. to this this endeavor because the Chips Act money runs out, for example, in 2026. Right away, you're going to probably want to be discussing follow ons here because the industry needs to have this sense. That um, you know that the U.S. is committed to this over the long term, and this isn't isn't just a politically driven thing. That you know this is really going to going to fly in the U.S. Um, and I think you know that the commitment of the, this administration to this seems pretty pretty strong, and that the team that they've already begun to assemble at the White House uh, under Secretary Raimondo to is is very strong. Uh, but there's still some skepticism in the industry over the long term commitment of the U.S. to industrial policy of this type. Okay, yeah. The, yeah. Peter, you want to make a uh, comment? Now, let me let me just jump right in there after Paul's uh, you know very useful analysis. Um, the the right and the left are both wrong on this. They do a lot of name calling. The right says it's industrial policy. The left says it's corporate welfare. They're both wrong. Um, this is a crucial, formative, uh, uh, innovative technology that must get manufactured here to usher in a new digital economy. And that digital economy is coming, whether we like it or not. It's, uh, it might be digital transportation, it might be uh, digital healthcare uh, and remote healthcare. It's gonna be AR, VR, autonomous vehicles. I've, Paul was talking about his Tesla vehicle and, and uh, running on TSMC. That's, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that. But we need uh, to have that type of essential technology made here. And Paul was hinting at this, what the Chips and Science Act does is it incentivizes that process here, that investment tax credit, that's the 25% investment tax credit over a four year period of time is uncapped. It's not administrative, it's automatic, it's direct. It feeds right into constructing and building critical facilities here. Micron announced just today, North in North Syracuse, a $20 billion memory fab. That's fantastic news for the country in terms of high tech, high wage jobs and a tremendous rate of return for the US economy. You put some money into it, and in terms of Micron paying out more in taxes, in terms of per personal incomes that will surge at two or 3,000 people that will be hired in North Syracuse, as well as the supplier network that will get built in, that's fabulous news for upstate New York, just like the news that we're delivering and what we're doing in Phoenix. So uh, the, the names, it's unfortunate, the connotations that these names, this, industrial policy, corporate welfare have 
let's get past that. We're in a different era, a digital economy that absolutely requires semiconductors at the base uh, foundation. So uh, Chips and Science Act was really a masterstroke. Like Republicans and Democrats, we got pretty good bipartisan support right. on this. We, we worked on this for 26 months. Uh, all the brick and mortar work went into it, and a lot of reasonable folks on both sides uh, voted for it. Mm. Yeah, and I would just focus on that again. I think the, the, the other key part of this is that it really is, it's not just the government, right? I mean, this, this is a, this is sort of, I think Secretary Armando talked about catalyzing the private sector. And so I think Peter is exactly right that something like the Micron decision, you know, this is, this, this, the fact that the U.S. government is in the game and, 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 and providing these things like these, these tax, tax incentives are, are, are critical and that will galvanize the sector. So if you look at the absolute numbers here, they seem small compared to the, you know, CapEx plans for the industry to 2030. But, you know, you got to start somewhere. And this is this is a critical down payment, arguably, on that process of, of, of figuring out, you know, what the U.S., how, how much onshore manufacturing the U.S. can, can, can handle um, and getting getting those those useful uh, cycles of, of innovation going. And then, you know, STEM education, workforce. I, one thing we didn't mention is the workforce development is a critical part of this whole thing in a chip sack. And so all the applications for, for chip sack money will have to include some nod to how the companies will improve the workforce uh, p- piece of this because that's really critical. And Secretary Mundo is very, uh, very eager to see that uh, that part of the of things take off, so that you know the U.S. trains and uh, hardware engineers and software engineers to help to to run these these facilities. Um, and really, you get sort of a virtuous, a virtuous cycle where people are now interested in this uh, in this career in these in these in these areas um, in ways maybe they weren't you know without the the the, the focus on the chip sack and the focus on semiconductors. So it's it's the idea is to sort of create a virtual cycle, leverage the private sector, uh, and, and catalyze the private sector. I think that's probably the best term, um, and really get things going. And yeah, and it, it, this is this is a really this is a ten year process, right? I mean, as Peter said at the beginning, it's hard. It's going to take time, but you know you got to. You got to sort of jump in there some at some point, and uh, and so in this sense, it's great that the Chips Act has been been pushed forward. Um, but we, we, you know, the, the the industry time horizons are pretty long, right? And then as you as we've talked about, the roadmap sort of runs out in 2030, and then you're going to be into these other areas, uh, the, the the packaging and some of the other areas. And so at, by that point, the U.S. should be well poised to be player. You know, U.S. companies should be really well, and U.S. based facilities should be really well well positioned to 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 help with that. You know, transition into into a different game as Moore's law runs out. So it's all, it's all good. And it's, it's, it's just going to, you know, you, you got to sort of, the, the thinking has to, has to change it a little bit. And then the U.S. education system has to step up and there's lots of pieces that have to fall into place to make this all work. So, so someone from our audience uh, raised the question, uh, why are we putting all these uh, new plants in Arizona and New Mexico? Do, don't semiconductors require a lot of water and we're putting them in deserts? What's, what's the logic behind that? Um, well, that's a reasonable question. So Phoenix is semiconductor country USA in terms of its power, its STEM migration pattern inward. Uh, ASU has amazing STEM talent there already. Water actually is um, not as much of a problem as you might think since we recycle most of our water. We'll use about 14 million gallons per fab, fab 21 would use about that. And our offtake from the Colorado River will not be significant to start off and we'll get to 100% water recycling. So that's that's not an issue. Um, so water power, rule of law in uh, corporate tax structure, uh, seismic issues in uh, Arizona are all quite good. So um, yeah, there's, there's other, there's also final point, there's an existing supply chain line in there. There's 65 companies already set up in Phoenix, including uh, Intel, which is a terrific company, NXP, which manufactures there. So ultimately think about a TSMC as um, trying to achieve the best capital efficiency possible given the costs that we face. In Phoenix, uh, we looked at four or five places. I was part of this effort three years ago and Phoenix was dynamic and, uh, and, and, and checked all the right boxes. So we're thrilled to be there. Yeah, and again, let me just add that it's all about clusters, right? So Peter has just described what is what is you know arguably probably the, the top cluster in the U.S. because um, the industry again sort of relies on these key suppliers being being nearby, um, sort of economies of scale in terms of using. Uh, technicians to service multiple facilities. Uh, TSMC has has sort of perfected that in in, in Taiwan. Like you can 
TSMC can put 50 engineers on a train, a high-speed train down to Kaohsiung from Sinchu to solve a problem. And so you need you, these geographic clusters are really sort of the, the way to think about this. So in the US, we'll probably have you know several of these. We'll have the Arizona cluster anchored by TSMC and Intel. We'll probably have a, we'll have a cluster in Texas with a Samsung. We'll have a cluster in Ohio where Intel is building uh, two, two big fabs. Oh, uh, Ohio State will be involved in that. So, and then in New York, you'll have an R&D cluster, say in Albany. And then, you know, maybe you could say Oregon where Intel has some advanced uh, facilities there will be another cluster. So you'll have these series of clusters, which will be where companies decide, you know, to site facilities. TSMC is already attracting its suppliers to, to site facilities in Arizona. So it'll be this sort of clustering effect which will also include local incentives, which, you know, in addition to those federal incentives under the CHIPS Act, the Arizona local governments there, of course, have also pro are providing incentives to, to come to the TSMP to site there. So again, that sort of virtuous cycle gets going where, you know, everybody wants to be in that cluster and and all the, and, and, and that becomes a, a place where there's talent, there's education systems, uh, kind of like Silicon Valley, you know, how Silicon Valley started. And, and, and you, you need that, you really need that to help drive the industry um, in these, in these kinds of locations. But that's the case in Europe, also where Magdeburg in Germany, for example, is going to be a, a sort of is a cluster with uh, Infineon, and Intel will be will likely be there. Uh, and so th this this is the way it works, right? It, it, most effectively uh, to, to have clusters, and the U.S. has has played that game a little bit, but I think now it's going to be on steroids um, as we look to places like Arizona uh, and TSMC. Well, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I I also spent time at ASU, and uh, a few years ago, Intel and uh, ASU and the USAID uh, worked together to redesign and uh, double E education in Vietnam, uh, oh. a really big project. Um, and that was because uh, uh, Vietnamese engineers were trained according to the old Soviet model. And uh, there was a sense that uh, Intel was going to need another labor force outside of China. How do you put all of this in global context? The US needs Chinese engineers. Either they go to work for Huawei or they go to work for Cisco or whoever else is in the United States. I mean, it's a global talent pool. And are we now doing taking actions that are gonna short circuit our ability to have a pipeline? And uh, will companies like Intel, et cetera, need uh, these engineers in Vietnam and other places? Because China obviously is not going to be an available place to make these kind of uh, chips and, and do the testing or packaging or whatever is going to be part of the, the supply chain. Um, well, let me, let me zero in uh, uh, in terms of Paul mentioned workforce issues and engineering talent is critical. We'll have 2,000, 2,200 folks uh, at our first fab. That's just the starting point for us. And um, let me just start with uh, the, uh, uh, high, uh, we should improve the high-skilled immigration uh, system in our country to uh, allow big investments like this to flourish. And part of the issue here is when you go to Carnegie Mellon or Caltech or Columbia, uh, most of the MS and PhD uh, STEM talent, uh, a lot of them, a high percentage of them are foreign nationals. And so the US uh, needs to get its house in order on this topic. I've worked on it for many years. Uh, I think Paul's very, very familiar with it uh, in terms of the current system in place of uh, optional practical training, H-1B visas, there are not enough of those. Individuals have to wait uh, for too long a period to get their green cards. The United States, I think, appreciates uh, all of these uh, subjects, uh, these topics, these problems, these gaps, these choke points. And lawmakers uh, on one end of Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, president hopefully can, can make progress so that the Chips and Science Act has that workforce uh, engineering support uh, to, fill these, uh, to fill these fabs. So I, I'm a little bit more focused in a linear way on the US system being improved it's not easy. Immigration is an incredibly uh, difficult topic and solutions uh, are, uh, are, are sometimes distant, but we're hopeful. Yeah, and I'll just add that's this great. I mean, again, I agree with everything Peter said here. It's a tough problem. You know, it's it. I think and not just the U.S., but like Japan is are, is 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 um, grappling with this in a little different way, in the sense that you've got to sort of incentivize the education system to get people interested in STEM education, and then specifically things like hardware engineering. Um, if a country hasn't had that, 
that sort of tradition, like in Taiwan, obviously, it's it's very prestigious to work for a company like TSMC, and so people want to go into hardware engineering. In Japan, they sort of they used to be a, a major player in the industry, for example, but they sort of you know their companies weren't so much at the cutting edge of manufacturing, and so part of the reason they're trying to attract TSMC to build a facility, it's not cutting edge in in Japan. When I talk to my Japanese friends, they say you know they they want to jumpstart interest in the sector and 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 get the education system to crank out people who are interested and now have an opportunity to work uh, in the sector in these really uh, in interesting and cutting edge jobs in hardware engineering, for example. Um, but then, you know, the, the, the U.S. problem is is very much this issue both of, of both the, the domestic workforce and, and getting universities involved, but also this immigration issue, which I think is is, is really tough and, and, and probably, is, as usual, has been discussed as part of broader immigration reform, something like the H-1B program, which is which is really, you know, is, is a problem, frankly. <laughs> you know, th th it's a lottery. So we, we've we sponsored, you know, really promising candidates for certain positions, and they have a one-third chance of getting, of getting in, right? And so that whole process, how do you reform the H-1B system so that these kinds of positions can be filled by qualified foreign nationals, and they're not taking you with, you know, U.S. jobs um, is, is really critical. I think going forward here, and so potentially in the second half of the Biden administration, we'll see some more focus on this. But that's definitely a problem because you need both. You need sort of the immigration system to work, and you need the domestic education system to be sort of uh, cranking out people who you know are qualified and really want to work in the industry. So let, let me go back to the the Chinese case because uh, obviously, Paul, you mentioned. Uh, a lot of effort underway now to restrict, to limit, to constrain uh, Chinese access to uh, not only the chips themselves, but also all of the production equipment. And so at the end of the day, you know, there is this big question, how successful can the United States really be? And uh, um, if you look at our allies, the Europeans, the South Koreans, Israelis, etc., all of them are not particularly happy about, you know, basically shutting down the potential for some huge business. Uh, Peter, you mentioned TSMC has lots of big customers on the mainland um, uh, in terms of just simple chip sales. So what, uh, you know, what kind of effect will the these restrictions actually really have, uh, particularly if the Chinese, it may, it may not be when they get their act together, it could be just, you know, it's not if, it's when, you know, they're going to get their act together, as the they've shown in a number of cases. So um, are, are, can this restrictive policy really have uh, the desired impact of slowing them down significantly? Well, let me let me make some quick comments, and, and again, uh, I know Peter may, may be a little more sensitive to get into this topic, but yeah, it's a tr it's really tricky, Dennis, uh, and it's a complicated issue which we could devote you know many hours to on its own. Um, I think the question is still sort of what's the goal of the U.S. Uh, uh, government in doing this, and I think last week we saw Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, articulate for the first time, arguably, what the U.S. strategy was here. He talked about this idea of, of um, initially, you know, the U.S. policy had sort of been informally keeping China, Chinese companies, two or three generations behind the cutting edge, depending on what you're talking about. And now he's saying, well, that's sort of, now, now we need something different. And we're, we need to look at sort of foundational technologies and right. how, and keep the U.S. ahead in these other areas. So that's a, but you know, that's still sort of a very general high level statement, you know, how, to, how that translates into actual policy is tricky. One good example, though, is this this GPU restriction, which is really driven by this concern uh, that some of the these advanced semiconductors, all of which are made in Taiwan by TSMC, by the way, the 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 the, the, the Nvidia A100 and H100, for example, are these very sophisticated systems that are put together, multiple versions of them, um, and they're used to do um, several things. One is to accelerate uh, high performance computing. The other one is to run AI, you know smaller AI workloads. Maybe in a way before or before you run on an expensive HPC, you can run those on a more sort of economical platform with those A100s. Um, and so the U.S. government seems to be very concerned, for example, likely about the diversion of those systems to some military applications. We did see last year this whole big, big uh, attention to this, the Chinese designing, for example, this uh, hypersonic glide vehicle, which, which surprised, apparently surprised U.S. analysts um, when they tested it in August of last year. Um, and it turned out that 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 was 
likely an, a high performance computer was was modeled on a high performance computer that used chips manufactured in Taiwan by TSMC by Phidium in this case. So there's been a lot of focus on the, the potential for these semiconductors, these very capable semiconductors, which are manufactured, designed maybe in China, but manufactured in Taiwan, to then end up in some of these high performance computing systems that are used to model weapon systems. And so this is one of the, at least another one of the problems the U.S. government is trying to solve for is to try to reduce, you know, the, the potential for that to happen. So, so the U.S. maintains its lead in the high performance computing arena. Um, but the question of sort of how you do that and, and what, what you know, what facilities you target, obviously uh, the HPCs are used for life sciences, for, you know, drug discovery, a whole host of other things that the U.S. government should not be concerned about, right? But there is this segment of the, of the, of the, of the sector that's obviously uh, is involved in, in some of these areas of weapons design. And so the, you know, how do you, how do you use the existing tools? A dilemma, I think, is how do you use the existing export control tools, for example, or a new outbound investment review, for example, to, to address that problem? And I think that's sort of where we are right now, which is um, the, the, the U.S. government is probably going to overreach and ban, for example, the sales of those of those uh, GPU systems to China, and then maybe pull back and be able to and license, you know, facilities in China, for example, that are that are that are doing pursuing life sciences or other things that are not considered, uh, you know, a national security concern, maybe license those. But we're sort of in this area where I think the U.S. government wants to gain, gain more control over all aspects of the semiconductor supply chain where U.S. companies are involved, and then have a more granular ability to determine, you know, which companies uh, in China are able to access that technology because of these tools, uh, these concerns. And the, the challenge there is how disruptive will that be to the industry? So NVIDIA, for example, in their, uh, their Edgar SEC filing, said, that the, they their understanding of the of how the controls might be implemented, which we don't know yet, uh, they said that would could potentially cost them four hundred million dollars, I believe, quarterly basis, right? And that four hundred million dollars, by the way, and all those chips are manufactured at TSMC. So the ripple effects in the industry of how these controls are going to be implemented are, are huge because if you just look at that market in China for A100s, it's it's large, right? It's very large. Um, and if the U.S. is going to indeed ban that, then you know the ripple effects going back to Nvidia and it's sales and its R&D budgets and, and, and ability to innovate, of course, you know, are all going to be impacted. And in some cases, it's hard to make the, determine the impact on the industry beforehand, right? Unless you really dive down into the supply chains. And so we don't really know um, how, how this will impact the industry. We do know that, that when these restrictions were put on Huawei, that they had a big impact, right? Because a lot of U.S. companies were prevented from sending, selling basically commodity semiconductors to Huawei, and that impacted their bottom line. Intel, for example, 35% of its revenue is from China. So the revenue to build those fabs in Ohio is coming in large part from China, right? And so the so the so when these market, a market like China is cut off from, from, to big players, it definitely has an impact on you know, the U.S. players and their industry and the ability of the, to, to plow that back into R&D and innovate. So there's a feedback loop there, and we have to understand that, I think, uh, or there's the risk of the industry could be, you know, the industry could really be disrupted in ways that, for example, may have contributed to the the, the global chip shortage, uh, because the industry is so market driven and sort of just in time. Uh, and and if you disrupt that, you have to be very careful how you do that. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think Paul has, has captured it well. Um, the U.S. is creating choke points in lots of different places. Uh, the Jake Sullivan speech was very important. I'm, I'm very uh, good friends with Tarun Chabra, one of Jake Sullivan's deputies. He spoke on Friday about um, gaining an absolute advantage. It was the phrase he used vis-a-vis uh, -vis China in the tech space. And that means if way upstream with electronic design software, that's gonna be subject to some new licensing, the most advanced software. The fabulous companies, as Paul artfully described, are going to face some licensing restrictions. The tool makers, applied materials, are going to face restrictions. The foreign direct product rule and is going to hit uh, the makers, the fabricators, uh, the uh, IDMs, the integrated device manufacturers like Samsung or TSMC or Intel. So they're creating choke points. And the... It, how they implement will be very, very important. Uh, Tarun reassured people when he spoke on Friday about um, the Chinese people uh, are not the target. Uh, the commercial marketplace is not the target. They're after military civil fusion targets in China. And we're going to abide by the letter of these new regulations. It's, it will be challenging. 
to understand them, to interpret them, to implement them, but they are headed in a certain direction and uh, it, they are certainly in a powerful position to do so. Yeah, I think that choke point, Let me, that uh, choke point analogy is, is, is yeah. spot on, uh, Peter. I think that's exactly what, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's the ability to sort of granularly man, manage those choke points uh, in ways that are attempting to achieve this, this broader national security goal. Um, and that's, as, as I totally agree, it's tricky because these are complicated uh, in, industry supply chains. And then these tools like the US export controls are having to be sort of tweaked and updated and, and, and adjusted uh, to, to try to achieve those, those sorts of ends. And it can be complicated. If you've ever read uh, and, and, you know, the EARs, the Export Administrative Regulations, um, they're pretty arcane. You need, you know, you need a team of lawyers to do that. Um, uh, we've worked with a, with 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 lawyers on that, on that front for clients, and so it's gonna, yeah. The the the, the going forward, it's gonna, you know, be even more. Uh, it's gonna be even more lucrative to be an export control lawyer in D.C. Um, as companies try to navigate this space and understand, um, you know, where the lines are being drawn. Because basically, it's a combination of choke points and then drawing a line. You know, drawing a line at 14 nanometers, for example, on the on logic, and drawing a line on memory at 120. 28 layers or wherever they're going to draw the line and drawing a line on GPUs at some, you know, maximum throughput. Uh, and so th th there's a, there are these lines being drawn and then these choke points being uh, sort of adjusted so that the U.S. government has this granular control over uh, the end users. Okay, let me, we have time for one last question. So let me uh, uh, put it before the both of you. Um, uh, Peter, you mentioned uh, Ronnie Chatterjee, who's a, our Duke colleague, and uh, uh, that he's become sort of center stage in uh, uh, leading the implementation of the uh, the Chips Act. So, if Ronnie were in the room right now, maybe he's even on the uh, on the webinar. Uh, what advice might you give to him uh, about how to move forward uh, in terms of dealing with the complexities of the current uh, situation facing the semiconductor industry? And each of you, we have a, about two minutes each of you for to give a, a quick answer. Um, he's a, a very bright guy. He's got a very nimble mind. He needs to listen, ask a lot of questions, listen and educate himself. This industry is complex. It's discreet. And I'm sure he's going to do a wonderful job in implementing this program. This $52 billion in chips money is uh, an extraordinary down payment on the innovative future of America. His hands are at the controls there, and I'm confident that he'll uh, self-teach and then make the right decisions. Um, so I, I think that's uh, the prospects are excellent with Ronnie helping the president. Uh, and then the only other final point I'd make, and I, I, is maybe another thing for him to think about is to vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, Paul mentioned to Tony Blinken in a speech he gave back in the spring, which where uh, Secretary Blinken talked about investing, aligning, and competing. Investing here, that's going to be Ronnie's job, to help this country run faster on chips, better chips, aligning with partners, but competing with China, but not getting over the top. China's not an enemy. Uh, let's compete and uh, uh, in a fair, good, strong way. And that's what we're seeing from the United States. And I think that uh, uh, the, the, the prospects are very bright uh, in terms of the chip business here domestically. Uh, and the Tony Blinken speech was, was, uh, was modest and thoughtful along those lines. So I think Ronnie is, uh, we have high hopes for him. Yeah, and I, I again agree with very strongly with Peter's last last issue there in terms of competition and you know making it about competition and fair level of playing field, focusing on things like leveling the playing field. This is what companies want, right? Companies are a little uncomfortable. My clients um, with you know restrictions, uh, overly restricting things. Let's let's focus on areas where where the the playing field is not level. Level of playing field. Absolutely, you know, when there's national security issues, you know, try to keep the, we hear about small yard, high fence kind of thing. Uh, try to limit the, the, the restrictions so you're really focusing on solving a, a national security problem and not being too disruptive to the industry. So I think that's critical. Um, in terms of the CHIPS Act, I think, yes, it's, it's it, the Secretary Mondo has assembled a great team. There's a new industry advisory council um, which, is, which is very broadly representative, includes a lot of academic uh, institutions that will be involved in some of the workforce stuff. Um, and then um, I think it's just a challenge though, because there's not a lot of, uh, of sort of um, really 
experienced executives or that are on this team that really understand the industry as Peter has described you know sort of in great detail all the pieces of it the supply chains the the geopolitics of it the you know the individual companies and the technologies and so right now I think Secretary Mondo and some of the people she's hired they're trying to you know they're trying to bring on industry people because I think the challenge here is listening to industry understanding the industry as as you go forward here because these decisions are going to be complicated right it's not just about manufacturing as we've talked about some of that money is going to have to go to workforce development. Probably 10 to 25%, I think Secretary Mondo said, is going to go to legacy semiconductors, right? So and it's not all going to be focused on, on the cutting edge because, in part, because the chip shortage affected some of these legacy nodes um, and auto, auto companies and device man, and medical device manufacturers were impacted. So they're going to have to definitely manage, you know, the mix of legacy semiconductors, advanced semiconductors. You've got new technologies like silicon carbide, um, gallium uh, arsenide, gallium nitride. And so, you know, all these things are going to be at play, plus all these other pieces of the supply chain that we've mentioned. Uh, how do you how do you fund those? What mix do you need of wafer manufacturing and processed gases and 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 other chemicals and materials that are critical to the industry? So the the people managing that at the at, at the at the White House level and the Commerce Department are going to really at the at the Chips Program Office are going to need to really um, have a lot of industry knowledge. Listen, as Peter noted, to the industry because you know this is this is the, the government wants to play a, a, a constructive role here, not sort of a too heavy handed a role because the industry is so market driven that all these decisions have to make commercial sense, right? At the end of the day, you can't be making, forcing companies into, into positions where this, you know, it doesn't make sense for them to build a facility in the US, or there's another way to do that in another country that's sort of friend shoring that might make more sense. So anyway, so the, the, the economics and the commercial nature of the industry mean the government role has to be very deft uh, in, in, in dispersing this funding and making sure that, that you've addressed addressed all parts of the of the of the picture. I think Secretary Mundo stressed this last week. Again, she's talked about a holistic, looking at this holistically. And she said, hey, you know, this is not about just, you know, advanced manufacturing, but it's a, it's really taking a holistic look at the whole innovation system around semiconductors and making sure that that pieces of that are reproduced um, on a commercial basis in the US. And so that's where I think the challenge lies. But yes, I think it's a great team. Uh, and I would just say again, yeah, listen to industry and listen, you know, make sure that you understand the dynamics of the sector because, as Peter has said several times, and I totally agree, it's you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not, a, it's it is the most complicated thing that humans do, arguably collectively, right? Is build, you know, that GPU that's in your uh, in your smartphone, that CPU, and that whole everything in there is the result of you know a lot of complexity and a lot of innovation and a lot of people, and so you got to do it carefully. Great, great. Well. On that, uh, that note, I will thank our two speakers today. Uh, you've given us really a lot to think about and uh, about something that is a problem, an issue that's not going to go away for a while. So let me thank you and uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Let me also thank my colleagues, uh, Artie Rye, Stuart Benjamin, and David Hoffman uh, for helping us uh, put together this program and also the staff uh, at uh, CPI. Um, and particularly Balfour Smith, uh, uh, who uh, without whom we couldn't uh, put this together. Um, I hope you'll join us. We have uh, two further forthcoming programs this uh, fall. On November 9th, we'll have Jimmy Goodrich, who's a uh, vice president from the Semiconductor Industry Association, uh, gonna talk to us about uh, the, the global semiconductor industry, broadly speaking. And then on December 2nd, uh, Kelvin Drogemeyer, who was the former head of OSTP under the prior administration, and Laura Weiss, who's the senior vice president for research at Penn State, um, uh, they're going to join us to talk about uh, uh, compliance with some of these new research uh, directives and how they affect universities in terms of connectivity with China and other countries all around the globe. So we're looking forward to join us, uh, stay tuned, uh, stay in touch with the uh, Center for Innovation Policy website for the newest announcements, and we hope we'll see you again in the future. And again, thank you to our speakers for making the time available